this first incident, it didn't land like I thought it would, and it didn't end that way. I'd been working for two months for the Wall Street Journal in London. I was by far the youngest, um, the least experienced, but I was so thrilled to be going out every day to interview people for human interest stories. And I would rush back, sit down to meet the deadline, and everybody else is quietly at work. But the moment when you're done and you've met the deadline, back then they had editors and so on. <laughs> um, I wish they did still today. But I was standing up feeling so good, and the bureau chief came out and said, Kari, in here. And everybody looked around and went so sympathetic looking at me. And I sat down and I said, y y y yes, sir. I used to be a stutter. Uh, um, he said, I'm really glad you're coming in and you're meeting the deadlines. You know, that's the basic minimum. Um, but I was at a social gathering last night, and I ran into three people from very, very different worlds, and you interviewed them. And they said, you kept asking questions. And I thought, oh, no. He said, but what happened was, they said when talking it over, they got insights about other things they were doing. And so I gather, Kari, you're not asking them questions just about the story I asked you to cover, but other things. I, 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 yes, uh, that's true. He said, well, I went home and I fumed to my wife, and then I sat down and I thought, hmm, she might have a special talent there. I said, really, what? He said, well, you know, some people I'd send in, if you ask them those questions, they might have smashed you in the face, but there's something about you, they just keep on a talking. Uh, and I said, is, is, is that good? Uh, I think so. What I want you to do is, after you've written the story I asked you to do, that's an agreement, right? I said, yes. He said, then why don't you take notes on the other things you learned? And in a future story, you might realize there's some comments from them that would give you an extra angle on the story that further differentiate. I said, thank you. This is the lesson I'm telling you. One of the best gifts you can give people is to give them an insight about a talent they did not know they had. I walked out of that room and I was just beaming and the guy said, are you fired or are you? I said, no, I'm fine. And we've stayed friends all these years. And then he went back and he said, Kari, one more thing I want to ask you. you. You're not interested in sports, right? I said, frankly, no. He says, I'm sending you to Barcelona and I want you to cover a football game. I, a yes. There may be some side stories in it where you would cover it and everybody else wouldn't even notice. Oh, okay. So I wound up going there and I was so stunned because there's this guy named Danny Owls who's just apparently a really renowned football player. And I knew that from the man sitting next to me. But in the first quarter, I didn't know what you call the things, quarters, um, I started noticing people in the audience were yelling these racial epithets about him. And they were gross. And I was just shocked. So the people on both sides of me are trying to comfort me, say, this doesn't always happen. This is just awful. But it got worse. And then there was the first break, or whatever you call it in football. <laughs> and people left. And when he came back out, strolling nonchalantly onto the field, this guy was waiting for him. And this guy ran up to him and said, you monkey. And he threw a banana at him. And I was just startled. And the man just went like this. And got it nonchalantly, peeled it back, ate a bite, threw the rest of it over his shoulder, and then he kept on walking on to the center of the field. And the roar of the crowd was positive, much louder and more widespread than the other. And that became the core of my story. Um, because what happened in that moment could have gotten really bad, but there was a shift or other people that were inspired that he turned a potential tense moment into something that really showed his groundedness. And you don't get that way if you haven't thought about those situations and faced something like that before. But later on, when there was a pause, these other kids started standing up throughout and they were pretending that they had banana peels and they were taking selfies of each other, throwing it over their shoulders and clapping, said, we're all monkeys, aren't we? And it was thrilling. So what he got was media coverage and a story that went all over the world globally. Mine was a small part of it. And he got known beyond the football field. 
And then later on, there was so much pressure about this racist person down the field that the manager of the stadium said, uh, you're banned, you cannot come back. What he said was, oh, no, no, I think we want to see if he learned a lesson. Let's let him back in and see how he acts, which made it a second news hook to a story, and it went out again. Now, here's my peculiar lesson from that. I believe in revenge. <laughs> How many of you do in your own way? We omit it. <laughs> but this is a second lesson I'm telling you. The sweetest revenge is a well-lived life. And you seldom have a chance to look as good as when you're around others who are not. And so when you start to fume and want to react, you may not know why someone did what they did. But the more that you act decent and gracious and act like they must not have meant it, and you speak to their positive intent, especially when it's clear that they have none, you're going to stand out. You're going to feel more grounded. You may have noticed that it's sort of a tumultuous time in our culture and the world. And I think rather than just being against somebody, is to shine a brighter light on a better idea as another alternative. And those are the leaders we want. I also call them the most valuable players because more people than being leaders that are popular these days are the people that are grounded and purposeful. It's one of the reasons I love this community here. And they're the ones, because they are, they're the ones that are more likely to cultivate a diverse network. Now, that's common. You've been hearing that a lot. But probably the biggest blessing in my life was able to cultivate unexpected allies around sweet spots of shared interest. And I want you to think about that. So when we're talking with each other, you might say, let's explore a sweet spot. Maybe we have one. Now, moving forward, another guy I got to interview, Carlos Santana, uh, late in his life, he got another award. And it was after things had not gone so well for him. And I didn't know much about him, but I got the chance to go interview him. And as I'm waiting for all these people that are eagerly interviewing him and they're asking questions about how does it feel to have the spotlight on you and what's the part that's most meaningful. And he was answering. Blah, 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 blah. And uh, then I, I came up and I said, what most matters to you out of all of this and this chapter in your life? And he just beamed. He said, you know what? I told my wife this, and she pointed out that it was true. I'm becoming the people I love. And then he went on to cite five people in such movingly specific detail, what it was he admired about them, and how he realized being around them spurred him to emulate those behaviors. And he said, and don't ask me the next question. Of course I told them that. And again, it was a great story for me, but it was an even greater lesson. So this leads to the next lesson. In my lifetime, being a stutter growing up and phobically shy, uh, startling my high schoolers the first time I gave them a keynote back in Portland. They came and they cracked up laughing. It was a library association conference. And they said, you're kidding, right? You're not going to put her on the stage. And it made the meeting planner rather nervous. <laughs> but what I'm suggesting is this. Once we identify what our core mission is in life and we get specific you well know that theoretically, but I know firsthand it enables us to make better choices along the way. When I got to cover the Carlos Santana story, I was just so deeply moved because, again, it was an example of someone choosing to shine a spotlight on other people, thus having it shine brighter back on him. So I'm going to another lesson. But before I do, turn to the more normal, the people on either side of you, and shake hands with them and say, let's talk about a sweet spot later on. If you move faster, you're more likely to have better options. <laughs> now, I'm sneaky by nature. What just happened as well as this is when we turn this part of our body, by the way, I'll never be able to do it like an earlier person that got us all moving as we went out, but just turning and having a warm smile at the same time, there's four different studies, because there's a lot of behavioral studies which are not thorough and they 
overexpand on their results. But this study says you get in sync together because you both turned, you have a warm expression, and it's the best stage to go to something else. So now my next lesson, and you might have gathered it. There's another reason I told you these stories, other than just feeling so blessed in my life by having unexpected allies that have enriched my life and made it more adventuresome. I believe, and this is the key word in my life these days, and it may surprise some of you, but think of the stories you heard earlier. It's the power of specificity. When I came in, I didn't give a preface or underbrush of background stuff. I dove into an example. Get specific sooner, and you're more likely to pull people in so they'll want to listen longer. The power of specificity goes this way. When you get specific about a project, a person, something you want to outgrow and avoid doing, you gain great self-clarity. And what I've noticed in my life is once I get specific about something, it's only then I realize, oh, it's actually not that. It's five degrees over. This is, or this is more important. So self-clarity is the first power of getting specific. Second is when you start with a specific example or detail, you pull people in to want to hear more. They can't help it. When you get specific, you become more credible, meaningful, and memorable. All good stories used to start that way. So think about that when you're thinking about how you want to explain something to somebody else. Because the more we know about something, some research says, it's part of the curse of knowledge, we tend to give a lot of background and generalities. The specific detail proves the general conclusion, but not the reverse. And one of the powers I've seen of this unexpectedly is that there's a specific story, and I know all of you as well as me have heard stories today that just stick in our mind, and we're going to be driving somewhere later on or talking to somebody, and it pops in our mind. So those are the nuggets. And one of the unexpected powers is that even someone who disagrees with you or may have a different view, they can't help themselves, and sometimes they cite your thing as well. That's happened in my life several times. So there's a reason I'm asking this, but you only have 30 seconds. Turn to that more or less normal person you talked to a moment ago and say to them, this is what I most remember in one sentence from what you just said, because specificity grows with brevity. So you've got 30 seconds, turn to each other and say, this is what I most remember so far, go. 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Brevity is better. But I hope it spurs you to want to talk more later on. So what I just want to say to you is, one of the things I most feel is important to us, we talk about that bubble we all live in, and one of the benefits of being here, thanks to the wonderful leadership team here and the staff, who I've learned a lot from, um, diversity in friendships. When you have a diverse group of friends, you see more sides of the situation. When I did a TED Talk, I said to people, there's that old saying, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. No. In any room, everybody's smartest at something. And the people become property, property, <laughs> opportunity makers are the ones that are able to articulate that, say, I think, let me say out loud and see what you guys think. You're, you seem really good at this and this and this. Let's talk about a sweet spot of shared interest. Maybe there's a way that we can work together. I've worked in a lot of tech companies coming in to talk about quotability and connective behavior. And the biggest thing I see is that a lot of them don't think they get to use their best talents on projects that are meaningful for them. But when you're able to cultivate allies with different temperament and different talents, there's other opportunities that happen that every day I'm so grateful for the flow of people I know in my life and the ways we get to help each other. Um, but another part that's really powerful about that 
is people that have diverse allies are more likely to see an opportunity or a problem and connect the right partners to put together the team that come, and come up with the fastest, best solution or opportunity out of it. So I think it's good to talk specifically with your friends about your best talents with each other and about what most matters to you, cutting to the chase. It's made a huge difference in my life. I remember I was rushing to give a keynote one time. I was in an elevator in the fourth floor, and I opened up and was rushing out, and I knocked this guy down. It was scary because he's laying on the ground, and he got up, and he was that much taller than me, and he could have done all kinds of things. He says, is that how you usually start conversations? <laughs> it not only cracked me up, but everybody around him. In other words, he turned a potential hostile situation into a point of curiosity, and, and he said, tell me, where are you rushing to? And I said, well, I'm going to give a keynote, and I'm late, and I'm so sorry. He said, well, what's your best talent? So again, he got so specific. I said, what I hope it is, is teaching connective behavior and quotability. He says, I need some help on that. He says, by the way, you owe me. <laughs> I said, sure, that's, I do owe you. He said, I'll give you a card. Don't look at it until you after your speech because it will distract you. I couldn't help myself, but I didn't look at it, thank goodness, till afterwards. Because who I was, who I'd knocked over, you should figure it out if they're that tall. What was he? He was a basketball player for the Golden Gate Warriors. <laughs> and I got to wound up coaching him, which I insisted on doing pro bono. He said, I, this is the career I want, and I'm not gonna say his name, binding on disclosure. Um, he says, this is the occupation I think I want after I'm done with this current job. And he said, what are your ideas about it? because I don't know how to talk to them or whatever. I said, here's one idea off the top of my head. Whenever you're being interviewed by the media, make metaphorical reference between something you just did in the field with something that's happened in that profession or industry. It'll be picked up by the media, and then sudden people, some may I not know who the Golden State Warriors are, hard to believe, but others are, and either way, you're gonna become a topic of conversation. And he came back to me a year later, and this is the sweetest thing when people actually tell you how it worked. He said, there's two benefits, the one I thought was going to be the most important and the one that really was. He said, I've actually had some inquiries from three people that are high in the industry I want to be in. But the one that's really sweetest is I turned to my wife to help me with the metaphors, and she said it brought us closer. She felt she was giving something valuable, and it was clear she was better at it than me, and I'm so happy for that. So what I'm suggesting to you is this. When you're going through life and there's so much tumult, I was throwing a lot of specifics at you because I think it's so powerful. But having role models and having people that you see in action who are doing better than you at the skills you want, there has been someone like that over the years who I just have found, I listen to him, he always introduces people, telling them, oh, this is so-and-so, he or she, da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and does it so well, he's just sought after. And so Vala Afshar is an extraordinary example of that. The reason I got involved with this organization, and you might want to follow him around, it might freak out some people, but just watch what he does. More than anybody, he's continued to be a role model because it's about a mutuality mindset. It's about what can we do to help. He's already given me two ideas just when we were on the bus going over to the house. So this is what I want to say in conclusion. I want to give you an unexpected corny gift because a decade ago, one of my favorite clients made these cards with my picture on one side, but some of my sayings on the other. 300,000 of them. So you have in the audience here some people in the front, and they're going to turn around and take a card and hand it to the people behind on the rest of it. So if it gets up to you, take one card, please, and feel free to do it now. And just pr practice one thing that might be in that card. They may be a decade old, but a lot of those are important. And here's what I want to say in conclusion. If you have a tip about connective behavior and actionable insight plus a real life example. I'd love to get it because I'm writing a book next year, my last one, my seventh one. My last ebook has been ripped off by 98 people. Oh, the wondrous of the internet. Um, that's, I don't want to end on a down note, but I'd love to hear your actionable insight and your relevant example sometime before March. And it's an honor 
to be a part of this community. Aren't we lucky? Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>